Hi. <laughs> All right. So many people in the, in the waiting room. Cool. Cool to see everybody again. Um, I see that there is a lot of intro to architecture people and also some other guests, which is great. Um, so um, I know you guys are, uh, you know, terribly busy with your assignment for the um, uh, afternoon session, but so I'm going to try to keep it to about an hour. It might take a little longer. Um, I do, so I see that already most of you have turned your camera off, which is great. So if you haven't yet, please turn your camera off right now and then we'll turn on the cameras at the end for the discussion. So we'll all like, uh, you know, be able to, to see each other at the very end. So please don't, don't completely uh, forget about the camera, just turn it off for, for right now. And also mute yourself, I think, or you're working on that can mute it. Um, so, um, uh, we'll be talking about social media today. So, you know, bas basically all kinds of uh, posting, posing, um, all these different ways of uh, the way that we exist on the internet. And so, um, uh, basically I have a short, well, maybe half hour or so lecture, um, and then we will um, um, kind of have a discussion. So please, while um, I'm doing the lecture, please write down questions and please write them down in the public chat so that other people can see the questions and can respond to these. And also feel free to, if you see something that you like in the presentation, just you know, give it a thumbs up or say that you find it interesting or cool, want to know more about it. I will also share the Google Doc, uh, Google Slides that I made with all of you, so you can follow along on your own if you have a second screen, or you can just follow my presentation um, uh, when I'm sharing the screen. It's kind of whatever you prefer. Um, the Google Slides also at the very end has some additional pages, so you can, um, and I'll, I'll talk about it in a second, but I would like for you guys to actually make your own social media content um, during this workshop. Um, it's all, you know, obviously going to be really quick and fun and dirty, but I want you to just experiment and do something maybe that you haven't really done before. We've been talking a lot about memes. And so uh, uh, open that Google Doc and, you know, you can, you can edit things at the very end. Um, so I see more and more people coming in. Awesome. So for those who haven't heard it, um, I think everyone's already camera off, so perfect. Camera off, mute your mic, but you know, keep uh, keep writing things down. Don't be shy. Uh, there's going to be lots and lots of conversation happening, so be the first one to, to, to post a question, and then things will just will just start flowing. Um, all right. Oh, I should also just briefly introduce introduce myself. So my name is Vika. Um, I, uh, for those who don't know, I've been at DSAT for um, well. Seven years really, first as a student and then uh, as faculty teaching visual studies classes and also kind of focusing on, um, on you know, various uh, visual studies advanced classes uh, and actually very much focusing on questions of the internet um, uh, through, you know, as a sort of mode of representation. Um, but I haven't actually really spoken specifically about social media yet. So I think this is a new Kind of for me also very exciting lecture because it's actually something um, uh, kind of new in that sense that um, I think it kind of brings together a lot of things that I've been thinking about for quite a while in terms of you know th theory in terms of like ideas but also in a practical sense um, and I think in this last few months of um, you know isolation social distancing uh, I think we've all gotten to a slightly different perspective of or maybe I, I don't want to speak for all of us, but I'm saying for me, uh, you know, social media has definitely um, gotten uh, a different meaning and perhaps an even more important, um, it's become an even more important aspect in our lives. And so um, in architecture practice specifically, it also has, you know, um, had a really large influence. There's people who have very successful accounts and, very, and build successful communities through social media and most recently what we've seen uh, we've seen it before but I think more specifically very recently we've seen um, 
political activism also enacted through social media. So that's something that I'll go into here a little bit as well. All right, so um, without much further ado, I'm gonna go ahead and just share my screen now. So here. Um, Can you all see my screen? I guess, uh, yes. yeah? Awesome, thank you. <laughs> um, oh, and of course I'm starting at the last page instead of the first one, so let me start right here. Already gave it away. So um, just to start with, um, you know, again, talking about sort of like the history and at the very end, there's gonna be kind of a practical um, example, a practical application of how we're making a meme in three dimensions. So that's what you just saw, the turning meme. Um, uh, but you know, to start with, I'll talk about generally, uh, uh, generally what social media is and how we use it. So um, there's actually uh, you know, a lot of theoretical studies and media studies that are out um, specific about social media. It's actually a, a very uh, explored um, area. Um, oh. A black bar um, in front of the presentation. Okay. Yeah, so I, oh, we're seeing a, a little. Yeah, there we go. It's it's gone now. Okay, great. Okay, awesome. I think that was just the screen sharing part. I brought a second screen today, so I'm able to move things out. So please tell me if there's things. So now I also have the chat on my second screen, so you can also give me feedback there. All right. Anyway, these are some of the books that I find I found particularly interesting in terms of like thinking about. Uh, image uh, making and um, you know social media as a sort of visual and rhetorical device and uh, throughout this lecture I'll be I'll be sort of um, uh, leaning on these sources in, in some capacity and I also made a Google Drive folder um, with the various readings from some of these books so if you're interested, you can also message me and I can make those available to students um, if you want to dive deeper in some of these topics. Um, there is also, you know, a. Oh, sorry, that went too far. Um, there's also a whole bunch of literature trying to convince us to um, leave social media, so to kind of abandon it, or to, that our lives would be better without it. Um, and there are real arguments made for that, uh, you know, or real, real, real sort of reasons why uh, social media isn't isn't just good and I'm absolutely not uh, you know an advocate of social media per se. I think like all technologies it has sort of uh, positive aspects and negative aspects and I think well these books are more anthropological in terms of like trying to understand how social media works in our lives and how people use social media sort of people who look at social media from the outside these people are often sort of trying to give us a warning or trying to, to make us uh, critical and aware of social media use and there's a lot of a lot of misuse. So I just want to say that as a disclaimer that this is an important part, but so if I'm talking enthusiastically about certain social media practices, don't take that as an unawareness. I think that this awareness is absolutely there, but I think um, in terms of, you know, the architecture community and how it's being used, I'm primarily showing positive examples that I think are actually um, uh, useful and, and hopefully can, uh, yeah, can sort of contribute to practice. Um, so, just quickly the structuring this presentation. So, what is social media? Just quickly talking about what it is. Uh, then, you know, there is um, there, there, there essentially a big part of social media are simply spaces to socialize in, and the word spaces here is very consciously used in terms of, you know, when you think of it architecturally, those are those are spaces that we can enter that we can leave. Um, so, I'll show a few examples here, kind of. Uh, heavily biased towards actual three-dimensional spaces. Um, so AR, VR, and 3D desktop spaces, um, just to kind of show you a range of what kind of social, social um, media or uh, social uh, environments are out there. And then as I mentioned, you know, the, uh, how activism in social media, specifically in architecture, has become really important in recent time and, times and, and, and kind of became or kind of gave a voice to certain communities and certain um, uh, people who maybe haven't been able to, to do that in that way. So I'll show a few examples of that. Um, another thing um, 
you know, a question, I think for everybody who's, who's trying to create content is like, what actually makes a good post? What makes something go viral or at least popular, right? Like what, what gets the likes? So, I mean, <laughs> I will talk about that too. There's essentially um, a, a set of qualities that a post has that is being reproduced a lot. Um, and again, this is not uh, to say that this is in any way, the only way to, to be popular, just sort of one way of, of kind of um, analyzing what, what certain qualities are that tend to be popular. Finally, what are some tools that we can use to create this type of engaging content? Um, and again, here I'm being quite specific to architecture. I think there's obviously a lot more tools out there in terms of what people, how people are creating content, but in architecture, sort of thinking about the ability to show three-dimensional spaces specifically, I'm, I'm, I'm focusing on that. And then finally, um, uh, uh, I'll, I'll sort of show a little bit like, I'll show an example of, you know, how to, how to upload a 3D, a 3D model up onto the web and how to sort of make that into, uh, into a fun, hopefully fun and engaging post. So, um, all right. Oh, did I share the presentation actually? Um, let me actually share this with you guys just so I'm posting that into the chat so that you can actually follow along on your own computer if you want. All right, so in the, in the group chat, you can, you can now see the presentation. And like I said, at the very end, um, sorry, uh, at the very end, there's an empty slide and here you can post in your own ideas and your own sketches for memes as they come in. So while you're watching, you know, use it as a kind of sketch, a sketchbook and I can, you know, it doesn't have to all be on the same page. You can add more pages in or have your own page or work together on one. But I just, you know, I, I, I personally really like doodling. Um, when I, uh, when I listen, uh, I'm not saying you have to, but just wanna wanna give that as option. Oh, don't make a page here. <laughs> all right. Um, so, um, all right. What is social media? Um, so there's you know lots of definitions flying around, but essentially, social media is a computer-based technology that facilitates the sharing of ideas, thoughts, and information through the building of virtual networks and communities. So uh, there's lots of different subcategories and here you can also see kind of like a Western uh, uh, kind of grouping of different social media types, heavily dominated by Facebook that actually owns a lot of other social media uh, types that are pretty popular. But obviously there's much more and it's sort of like a changing ecosystem. So this diagram gets updated every, every year and you can sort of see how certain, um, anybody who's been following social media for a while knows that some platforms become incredibly popular and then uh, become less popular again. Um, and here's a Chinese uh, version of like sort of China's, Chinese social media, which you can see is a totally different uh, group of social media, um, but that kind of fulfills very similar functions. Um, I think what is important is that when we think of social media, social media we often only think of Facebook or only think of Instagram maybe, or these sort of very um, big uh, kind of sharing and networking platforms. But actually, um, even things like Spotify or Pinterest or any kind of platform where you can sort of uh, have your own input or, you know, add friends or add uh, other community members to, to your um, page are actually social media platforms. So for this class or lecture workshop, I want us to think of social media kind of in a wider sense. So not just, uh, uh, you know, the, the sort of commonly used ones, but also sort of uh, blogs of social media. Actually, Google Docs or Google Slides are absolutely social media. So while you are now, if you're, if you're sort of watching this lecture and you're looking at these slides and commenting on the slides or drawing something on the slides, we're actually, this is social media, right? Like we're doing this together and you, you guys are having an input Onto, um, onto this presentation, hopefully. <laughs> um, so there is uh, essentially uh, uh, Wikipedia, again, sort of like uh, uh, organized by, you know, by, by a multitude of people and the ability to connect to others in the network. Um, or Slack is actually a work platform, um, but that has a chat function that, again, you know, you, you, you're adding people into it that, it becomes sort of like a collective, collective form. So it has many, many different shapes, sizes, and forms. Um, and it really is, you know, I think what uh, kind of 
for most, for a lot of people, or I can say for me personally, most of what I'm doing on the internet is in some kind of social media platform. Um, and that is especially because I think a lot of, a lot of my work actually is also online. So using sort of like formats like Google Docs and Google Slides is also replacing paper, replacing sort of traditional modes of working kind of on your own uh, in physical space. You're moving all, more, more and more of these things um, online into the virtual space in a kind of collective format. And again, uh, keep taking notes and maybe you have a different idea of what social media is. So, you know, uh, think about that and we can, I'm happy to argue that question or think if that's actually, um, maybe you want to have a tighter definition or maybe you think that certain things should not be considered social media. So uh, this is also just kind of a prompt for you to actually think about what, what social media means for you specifically. All right, uh, so here are a few examples of things that you might not immediately think of as social media, but I think are quite interesting. So this is a, um, a gallery space in Mozilla Hubs, which is actually, for those of you who are intro to architecture students, we'll be using that in intro as a tool to, um, uh, to actually share our spaces and to navigate our spaces. And I want to just show you a little bit But <laughs> uh, I just want to show you the, uh, the interface a little bit so you, uh, you can see me walking around a space right now on my desktop. And this, this is actually done by the AA, and it was just an exhibition room where uh, you know you can you can essentially see um, different drawings. You can go up close, and it's it's uh, so the social aspect here is actually not not seen because the social aspect needs is that not to can be loved at the same time and they can also talk to each other. So it becomes, you know, uh, a platform that allows for socializing and for contributing content, therefore also becomes social media automatically. Um, then another example here is um, uh, the SciArc end of year show. So the SciArc end of year show was, um, a really fun kind of two, three hour um, intense live event that was happening on Twitch. And for those of you who don't know Twitch, Twitch is a live streaming platform for gamers. So people who, um, you know, essentially are really into showcasing. So that, that's kind of how it started, like people kind of showcasing live, live streams of their games and talking about it. So it's sort of very much optimized for that, but it also really worked super well for, for architecture actually. Here's uh, just a video of, of some of the content that was shown there. So a lot of it was sort of uh, uh, 3D live uh, uh, content that you could actually watch and importantly also engage in. So what made this a social platform was that there is on Twitch just uh, sort of multiple modification options in terms of you can you can add a chat, um, you can add um, members to certain kind of pages and you can and there was even one page that had a collaborative um 3d model where people were actually building a three-dimensional sculpture in twitch so um again you know if they would have done that same um presentation just on youtube or on zoom it would have felt uh it would still qualify as social media in a sense but um twitch sort of made it the you know, the format made it feel more gamified and more social, social in a sense, especially for people who are already kind of used to the platform. Um, and then, so these are all pretty recent examples because I think, you know, in the last few months when people were, um, uh, when, when schools had to rethink their end of year shows, uh, they had to kind of get really creative and start to work when, on different, with different methods. So here you see um, INDA, which is, um, uh, another really interesting school that they actually uploaded their entire um, their entire end of year show to Sansar, which is a 3D platform, also kind of similar to Mozilla House, but even more advanced. And here you see a video of like the avatar, so the students walking around in their own end of year show in the 3D environment, or sort of uh, you know socializing. So they're <laughs> pretty busy, busy team. Um, and, you know, the social aspect of it also disappears after a while. I mean, they, they were in there 
for a certain amount of time, but then um, after uh, I went there later, I didn't actually, I missed the opening and then I was in there all, all by myself. So it sort of felt, it felt a little bit like the AA show that we just saw where the social moment only exists for a very short amount of time. So again, you could question, maybe it was social media only for a certain amount of time and now it's just an empty exhibition. But again, I'll, I'll leave that uh, open to debate. Um, and there's been lots of online parties, like really fun events. Um, this is one called Club Cringe that has been really um, forward in terms of using 3D spaces and technology. And it was hosted on VR chat for a while and then moved to Second Life um, because of accessibility so more people could actually join. Um, but you know, uh, it's, it's quite, it is definitely a social experience. There was, uh, there was a, um, a kind of 3D environment where people could walk around. Um, that was happening and you see sort of they really build a custom atmosphere for for these events and at the same time there was a twitch stream and people were kind of chatting in the twitch stream and the music was playing there so it kind of combined two different platforms that were both designed for very specific users and made them into one successful hybrid so this is i guess a me meta social media um a platform where things are uh, uh you know used or hacked in a way that then becomes useful to, to that specific organization and here you see something that is, you know, very typical of social media platforms in 3D. You see people having avatars and really customizing the avatars. And again, as we will go into hubs in um, with intro, you will also have avatars and be able to customize those. Um, maybe not as crazy as these, but you can you can definitely make your own character. And then, you know, Zoom. I mean, Zoom obviously is used for work, lectures all these things, but it also is actually used uh, for parties. And what I found really interesting here is that, you know, uh, uh, as a mode of engagement, people really wait for hours until they have their three seconds when they're on and they're dancing or they're performing. So there's definitely something here in terms of like thinking about how social media really works because you also get the spotlight or you have, there's the moment when you are able to um, actually, you know, perform for everybody else. Otherwise the whole thing wouldn't really make any sense. So this is a, kind of an interesting takeaway from watching these events unfold. Um, and here another example, uh, Club Quarantine, um, that kind of had a constant kind of ticker of seeing how many people are in there. So you also have, a, even just this, this number, right? If that wouldn't be here, you would just go onto a website maybe and think, oh, I'm just listening to this music, I'm kind of by myself, but this number alone can, can bring the social into media or kind of like can make you feel connected to, you know, 1,834 other people who are actually enjoying that same music at the same time. So there's this life aspect um, is really, really important here. All right, um, are you guys good? Any, any like thumbs up or down so far? <laughs> I'm, I'm seeing the chat. Um, so, you know, talking about activism and social media. So, um, I mean, uh, all of you have have heard of George Floyd and probably most of you have seen the video. I think that was, you know, uh, social media at its most extreme in, uh, in terms of activism or in terms of, not activism necessarily, but in terms of uh, a short clip going viral and having a huge, huge effect. Um, and I found this quote by Omar Vaso, who's um, is part of an interview and he's, he's a professor at Princeton kind of studying uh, social media and activism and what he said is part of what social media does is allow us to see a reality that has been entirely visible to some people and invisible to others. As those injustices become visible, meaningful change follows. So that was specifically in reference to George Floyd, but I think it's true for a lot of different ways that social media has been used um, in an activist way. So it's really about, you know, making things visible, as simple as that. And so um, here's some examples. So very recently, um, there's uh, a list came out and on, on Google Sheets. And again, Google Sheets is also social media, right? Like everybody can contribute. You can see uh, what other people are doing in it. I've heard recently of a party that happened on Google Slides. So here's also, or Google Docs actually, and people came in and like edited stuff. So this is uh, a, you know, uh, a, a, a sort of political use where people are saying, okay, we, um, um, BIPOC or BIPOC, I'm not sure actually how to pronounce it yet, but th those studios 
um, uh, are, you know, studios of people of color um, are underrepresented in architecture. There, there's so many of them. There's literally, I think this list, I'm not sure exactly how far it goes, but it's, it's a long one. You can scroll down and it's a long list. Um, so just the act of making this list collectively and putting that online is, um, you know, you could call it social media activism in a sense, and it's sort of a way for people to bring out the invisible, bring out something that that hasn't been sort of seen and noted before. And I've heard from friends that that list had an actual effect. It got more applications um, um, and, you know, feel seen. So it's, it's, it's an important uh, tool or a way to kind of showcase, uh, showcase certain practices. And then uh, similarly, that was about two years ago, um, the Shady Architecture Man list came out, which was also a crowdsourced list and, uh, uh, you know, essentially exposed uh, men who had treated women in, in however the women felt unfairly. So it was, it, 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 you know, the, the, the list ranged from subtle situations to very extreme cases of abuse, but the point was that everybody was able to un anonymously write down what they had experienced and kind of expose these people uh, in a very public way. So again, uh, uh, you know, another way of exposure or another way of making the invisible visible. Um, and very recently we've seen a lot of people taking, using social media to take a stance or to take a position. So here is a quote by Leong Leong that, um, you know, when Black Lives Matter was really kind of uh, uh, sort of at its peak in terms of the protest a couple of weeks ago, they they posted simple statement just saying that they stand in solidarity um, and uh, uh, that they you know uh, support the movement. But also very importantly, they they said as architects we publicly acknowledge that no building is ever more valuable than human beings' lives, which is a very very strong statement. Um, and then. I think what is interesting in terms of, and we'll get to, to you know, the six P's, the, the reason some, a post is successful goes viral. At the end, they kind of give people a way, kind of action points or something, they, they, they suggest something that they had done. So they donated to certain organizations and they're, they're urging um, people to donate or to speak up or to do something. So that's kind of like a call to action here at the end of the post um, that makes it very effective. So it's sort of, you know, having a statement, kind of like broadcasting your own opinion, but then also uh, asking asking people to do something about it. So, um, you know, there's been many, many different reactions and a lot of them have also been heavily criticized and it sort of uh, felt like a very difficult time for people to actually communicate publicly. And that's also something I wanna talk about in the discussion. So think about that, have you ever, you know, thought like, thought about what to post or is it the right time to post or did it feel inappropriate? So I think that, that um, uh, this is, for example, an, an, an example of something that, that went really well. And here, another example, very recently, a few days ago, a friend of mine actually um, posted this, this uh, accusation really of uh, that, that the Met um, Metropolitan Museum in New York had treated her uh, unfairly and based on on racial bias and and you know that post is just people have shared it and that post just went went uh, viral and the Met actually then published that they will take action so it was actually a really really successful viral activist post I would say that that you know exposed a condition something that actually she had talked to me about years ago um, that was an injustice that was done to her and through social media she was able to actually finally draw attention to it in a way that made it so strong that the Met couldn't ignore it anymore. That, you know, this very, and the Met is like such a powerful institution, powerful institution. So like to, to, to sort of talk about the Met in such a public way and getting this attention is, is, is really powerful. Um, and then memes. <laughs> so memes as activism, uh, you know, are, are, I would say, exploding on the internet right now. There are so many different pages and um, uh, uh, kind of growing every day and, and uh, seeing new things. It's, uh, it's really, I would say, 
if you if you're looking for a new way to be creative in architecture <laughs> start a meme page with a few friends and and just publish it it's 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 a really fun endeavor and um what i would say is you know uh as with everything there's just so much nuance and different uh you kind of have to follow a page for a while to really understand their political uh direction and orientation because memes are often not necessarily super direct but I, sometimes they're ironic you know or sometimes and so people often misunderstand memes it's really fun to read through all the different comments but i think uh when you're an architect and you start following these architecture pages, you you'll start to understand these various references to things. And actually, um, you know, for example, uh, complexity and contradiction in architecture is a very famous book. Um, and so you have to kind of understand that reference in, all, in order to understand the meme fully. I mean, you probably understand a little bit without knowing the book, but it really just becomes funny to that community, to that subculture that is the architectural community here. So. Um, you know, it's, 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 yeah. And here, you know, here are rhino jokes. So for those of you who haven't used rhino yet, these are, <laughs> I guess, explaining the meme, but these are funny because it's essentially like taking a political statement, but then using the rhino interface as like it's framing, right? So, so sort of mis, not misusing, but sort of like uh, subverting the, the idea of rhino is a, a neutral tool that you just use to make designs. It's, it's actually sort of, uh, here, here used in a, in a, in a critical way. Um, and then, so this is the Uber meme and I'm actually, so, uh, I'm curious if anybody, no, I'm sure some, I'm sure a lot of you know, but like, uh, maybe some of you don't know which one is the original one. So that's why I, I on purpose made this page a little bit confusing. Uh, and this is actually an analog meme. So it sort of started uh, it was written, it was made in the 60s um, by Bob Venturi and Denise Scott Brown uh, in uh, Learning from Las Vegas. So they, it's a very famous architecture book again, same same authors as this book. And uh, what they what they were essentially saying um, is that there's two types of architecture: the decorated shed um, versus the duck. And and so this this meme was sort of like became this very famous icon of the decorated shed. Um, I won't go into the details, but it basically just means the box that has like a big sign on top, really what the meme is, or that sort of signifies to the outside what it does through signage and not through its shape. Uh, and so, but what's awesome about this is, you know, so I'll give it away for, for those of you who who haven't seen this before. Uh, okay, think, think a second and choose which one you would pick as the original, but Okay, so this one is the original, I'm a monument. Um, and all the other ones on this page are, you know, memes or so they're, they're copies. They're, they're kind of like versions that people have made. And this is really what makes a successful meme is sort of not just that it's funny, but it allows people to kind of engage with it and replicate it or just sort of uh, 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 put their own imprint onto it or their own ideas onto it. Um, so here you see a protester recently, probably an architect, I'm assuming, uh, who you know, took that took that picture uh, or took that, that drawing and sort of adjusted it uh, for his own for his own purposes. Uh, and here you see, you know, this again is sort of like an inside architecture joke. I was mentioning that the the duck is another sort of trope from that same book, and so it's sort of turning that duck into the decorated shed. It's sort of like a hybrid. A hybrid version of a joke, um, but yeah. Anyway, it's 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 a it's a classic, um, and also showing that memes are not actually something that is necessarily digital. It, that they definitely existed pre, uh, you know, pre digital era, and so it's just something that uh, now I think has, um, in in a sense, in that particular format of like text and image, become great importance because it's so easily shareable on the internet. But memes are sort of like, um, uh, you know, little pieces of information uh, uh, or sort of discrete ideas that can be replicated actually have a much larger history. Um, here, just another example of a really popular meme account by Ryan Kavnitsky. He, uh, you know, he's really like the, the number one memester, I guess, of his generation and get interviewed for it and in, in, in architecture very specifically. And here's just some, some of my favorite 
memes. Um, we actually did an exhibition that featured some of these memes a few years ago that was called Meme GIFs and Lo-Fi Drawings uh, here in New York. And those are just some examples. Um, so Joshua Citarella is a, a New York artist who extensively wrote about memes and political culture as well. Uh, this is another one of these things that I re recommend as a reading uh, if you want to get deeper into sort of, you know, how memes are used in, the, in a political sense. Um, uh, the, the particular essay is called Politogram in the Post Left, and he sort of analyzes how meme culture actually helps or sort of amplifies people's extreme political positions to kind of drive them into like even more extreme niche, niche, niche places. So here's some screenshots of sort of popular meme pages that just uh, create a sort of like fantastical positions that basically are parties of one where kind of one person just uh, sort of narrows it into one particular position and then through memes and through kind of internet culture, social media culture, uh, propagates their information and they become sort of pages for debate, for shit posting, for sort of, you know, various ways of, of, of expression that is very, very particular to, to that group, but also has a larger influence in society where people start to, um, you know, follow these pages and get influenced by them. So it's sort of, yeah, uh, just notes for, for your reading if you're interested in that kind of stuff. Um, all right, so everybody good? We're getting to the next chapter. So now, if you've been sort of, uh, 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 you know, vaguely paying attention, I think if you if you if you if you have any ambition to be a, a, a social media superstar or a memester or a Instagram celebrity in architecture, now now is the moment to listen. <laughs> and even if you don't, if you just want to use it, you know. Uh, for your own uh, practice or to share your own work. I think it's just interesting, interesting things to know. So the number one things that, and this is all after, um, so Limor Schiffman wrote this excellent book, Memes in Digital Culture. And so she kind of unpacks, she analyzed um, hundreds and thousands of samples. And this is sort of like her analysis of what makes a post go viral or popular. Um, and the number one aspect is, positivity and humor. So uh, essentially people like sharing positive things because then some, you know, they want to be funny, they want their friends to think they're funny. Um, so it's not necessarily just positive, it can also be something that is in itself positive but it, that has humor in it. So 90% of viral advertisements um, by professional companies include humorous elements. So it's really a big factor in terms of like how people are sharing something is that it has some kind of level of funniness or irony. That's why you see so many ironic posts also because even when people are making, you know, a serious statement, there's often like a hint of irony in that post. Another thing is provoking high arousal emotions. So this is what we've seen a lot. And this is kind of some of the activist posts that I showed earlier, sort of like uh, posts that make people angry, essentially. So it's not so much posts that make people sad, because when people get sad, they don't, they don't feel so motivated to repost. It's more when you feel angry and you also feel like that there's an actionable item, aka resharing, reposting, re-editing, that, uh, that actually, you know, leads to this kind of viral, viral content. So if you have something, a real issue, and you show a very clear way that it can be um, shared, that's, that's another good way to uh, to engage with your audience. And then, uh, so packaging, uh, simple uh, 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 sort of how does it look like or how does it sort of translate? The most important thing here is that uh, your, the content needs to be clear and simple. So anything that, you know, we have a lot of other media for complex long-winded long -winded ideas. There's books, movies, all this other stuff. But when you're creating viral content, the message needs to become distilled down to one idea because by definition, you know, uh, these media are very quick and so people have to understand it very quickly and be, can be, it needs to be very, very clear in order for people to, to get it. So clear and simple is just a kind of prerequisite for things. Another one obviously is, so it's got, you know, it's called prestigious. If somebody's already famous or has a lot of followers, that will help. Um, but, you know, that's not something you can always uh, influence. Uh, but what you can influence is positioning. So seeding strategy is simply like, uh, uh, so one, one, one important aspect of positioning that 
uh, all of us can control is timing, um, what time of the day you post, what time of the week even, and also, you know, being aware of what's going on in the world and not posting when something really big happens in the news or response. I think there's sort of a lot of, uh, a lot of knowledge in terms of like posting at the right time, um, which I think is part of positioning, but then also seeding. So sort of like either talking to people who have lots of, um, lots of followers to kind of repost it. So there's hubs and bridges. Hubs are people who just have lots of followers and bridges are people who bridge to some other group that is not connected to your social group. So um, those are sort of important seeding uh, mechanism or strategies. And then finally, uh, participation. So again, this idea that you know um, people can engage with your content in some way. Um, so either we're sharing it through um, some kind of call to action, uh, something where they feel that it isn't just something they're consuming, but they can sort of uh, share it or bring it forward. So these are the six piece. I mean, again, very sort of broadly and um, and not not every successful post has all the piece at all. It's like, uh, you know, uh, some of them only have one or two, but most of the really successful ones have at least like three or four of these um, of these characteristics, um, just because that's that's what really helps with with spreading that news. Um, so from that, I want to you know I want you to keep these in mind a little bit. And I see that people are not really posting any questions or comments, so just encourage you to 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 post it on the on the group chat just just so that we kind of have some discussion points um, at the end. So be the first one, we can do it. <laughs> um, so uh, I'm, I'm going to show a few specifically architectural examples of you know, successful online content. Uh, in this case, actually a few different GIFs that have uh, an element of humor surprise in it. You know, like, like, like this guy who kind of walks in and the, the painting that was previously still all of a sudden runs away. Um, uh, or, um, you know, this, this sort of still image that all of a sudden these curtains are, are moving. So sort of an element of, uh, of surprises here definitely present. And then here another, those are just uh, some beautiful architecture gifs that that um, that are also part of that exhibition that I mentioned earlier that I want to show you as a reference to sort of like making kind of funny and kind of like effective social media. So here you have these jumping windows, right? And you can sort of see the, the shadow behind, which is also uh, nice, you know, that you can use it becomes like a um, uh, uh, some, some kind of like animated facade the way you, you really see it. Or here you have a floor plan that just falls apart. Um, and here's some, some more examples by uh, Fufu or Paula Villaplana with her partner, um, you know, making GIFs. Uh, one very typical thing is GIFs that kind of rotate infinitely or kind of like have a loop going on where sort of one object or an element keeps looping so that it sort of visually uh, keeps going forever. And uh, or here we have kind of still image and only like a small aspect of the image just moving to kind of draw attention. And movement, so that's something I would maybe add to Linnor's uh, six sort of categories. This is something specific, uh, specific I think in architecture and also specific to web culture. Uh, as architects, we're very, very much used to drawing uh, on paper, right, and printing things on paper and kind of having a kind of print in mind. But when you're creating content for the internet, it's actually really good to recover its movement. It just draws your eyes. It makes it, it often can tell a story about your about your scene or about your interior or, or your your facade or whatever you're, you're drawing. So, you know, here you can sort of see the steam coming out of these things. So you kind of have a totally different idea of what this would be. Um, if it wouldn't be a still image. And it's also a really, really good way to show three dimensionality. I mean, even, even you know, in these, these spaces, they feel really activated because there's a slight movement here. 
Bika, just to interrupt you for a second. Hi, everyone. Yeah. This is Lila. I just wanted to let you know, Bika, that your audio quality is compromised when you switch from video to video, and it takes a couple seconds for the video to kind of catch up in processing. So just for you to be aware of, um, you'll start to cut out a bit, and also for the guests to know. If you don't hear something that Bika is saying because she's switched to a different video and, and the, the audio quality is compromised, go ahead and just pop something into the chat so that she can repeat herself because I just want to make sure everybody understands the audio is cutting out because the video is like too much for the for for Zoom. So just so you're aware of that, Bika. Okay, okay, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um wait, when you say from video to video when I switch slides or yes, exactly. Okay. It just takes a second for it to process that. And so your audio is compromised while it's working on the video and then it gets used to the video. So it, it moves on and then your audio is fine again, but just so you're aware. Okay. Okay, thank you. I'll, I'll try to give it some time to, to load. Um, all right. Uh, so everybody, everybody is still, could hear most of it. Give me, give me a thumbs up in the chat if you could follow the general gist. And um, if not, also let me know so I can repeat. I can repeat certain things. All good. Okay. I also speak pretty quickly. That's just kind of how things get downloaded from my brain. So also tell me, tell me if I should speak more slowly. <laughs> um, and also, there's so much stuff to go through that I find interesting. <laughs> so. Uh, so here, I wanted to show you uh, two more uh, sort of websites or examples specific to architecture. Okay, good. Okay, seems like you guys are, are fine. <laughs> uh, so here, uh, this is actually a student of mine that take, took one of the seminars um, last year, made this online exhibition now during quarantine. Um, he is an artist, so he studied a GSAB uh, in the master program, but actually now works full time as a, as a, as a painter and visual artist, uh, Jean Pierre. And he um, scanned his apartment in Chinatown and created this uh, kind of 3D walkable environment in which you could uh, look at his work. So it's still loading, but again, you guys have the link. So if you want to if you want to, you know, follow the link, you can just click on the image and actually explore it yourself. Um, but so here where you, you, know, you can navigate and actually um, look at the works in inside of this space. So I think it's a pretty wonderful way of, uh, of using 3D on the web as, you know, as an artist kind of drawing on his architecture experience um, and, and kind of combining these different formats. Uh, uh, in, in, in an interesting way. So he, he, you know, also calling it an exhibition and making a poster for it. So I guess he, he promoted it on social media. I found about it, out about it on his Instagram. So sort of, uh, and that is something I want to talk about now in sort of the last section of this is uh, that, you know, the way that web, uh, publishing often works best combined with social media. So when, if you just put up a website and even if it's the best website ever, that isn't, mm, uh, that you don't promote in any way, then people are just not gonna find it. So I know people often feel shy about, you know, uh, uh, publishing stuff on, 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 on their socials, but it's, it's really just, you can also just see it as an act of generosity in terms of letting people know about something you made. Um, <laughs> so, you know, obviously don't overdo it. It can be too much, but if you, I was very happy when I found out about this, because I, you know, I think it's a, it's a beautiful work and, uh, and I'm happy that he was able to kind of use this in a very personal way, some of the things that we talked about in class. Um, and then just one more example from a uh, former or so recent GSAP uh, professor uh, Stephanie Lin. Uh, she was teaching first year studio for a couple of years and here is her website and one particular pro project that she made where she uploaded this really like a rendering, a 3D rendering onto website. And what's cool about it, what you don't really see is if you open this on your phone 
and you move around in it, it moves spatially with your phone. So it's sort of like tilt, you can, you know, it's, all, it's like AR essentially where it recognizes the angle of your phone and you can sort of walk around in a space on, on the phone. Right now you're just seeing it on the screen, but that is, uh, yeah, uh, I think this is quite remarkable because we've, uh, there's, it's very common for people to upload 3D scan models or 3D um, sort of uh, realistic models, but this is really like a, a beautifully rendered space that she uploaded uh, onto her website that makes it, you know, easy to kind of understand the spatial conditions. But she, it is only bound to one spot. So it's, a, you know, like a 360 camera, you can't walk around in it, versus in this case, you can actually walk around and explore all parts of the space. There's different different platforms now we're talking more about that specific part the kind of 3d um upload part in the scanning workshop that's coming up in a couple of weeks but just want to include that here also because it's an important part i think posting and posing all right so uh we're getting close to the end of this the um here just sort of uh, some tools that, um, you know, are, I like to use, and it's kind of like a very personal list. It's by no means complete. I mean, there's way more, but uh, these are some, some tools that I find quite useful in terms of sharing content, in terms of um, uh, producing, uh, you know, architectural content specifically. So maybe the most interesting part here for you guys is the 3D tools section um, that includes uh, VR chat and Sansar, which Second Life, which are all 3D social platforms. So the examples we saw really early on from the parties and from people, the schools uploading the end of year shows are all living in that kind of space. And we will be using that in Mozilla Hubs. Um, and then Sketchfab is a really powerful platform to upload 3D models to the web. Um, and I'll show you that in a minute how that how that works because Sketchfab is really great because it allows you to use that 3D content in many different ways. You can use it for AR, uh, um, for AR or VR, and you can also use it um, for augmented reality AR and VR is um, virtual reality, just, just to clarify. Um, but the, um, uh, but it also allows you to embed the content on websites, um, send people link to that content and so on. Um, and so I want to end this lecture with another theorist. So Michael Connor is, um, I think the head, one of the head curator or the head of Rhizome, which is sort of a organization concerned with the internet and archiving the internet. And just want to highlight this one quote, which is digital culture is more about practices than objects. Um, so what does that mean? I think, you know, there's all these definitions, but I think in the end, it's a way of practicing or, um, and a way of sharing that is kind of specific to the internet. So that's really just the main point of this lecture is that when you're creating for the internet, you are kind of entering a large, you're entering a network and you're entering a discussion with many other people when you're, when you're on social media and you're also, um, uh, uh, you know, kind of, allowing co-creation automatically because you're sharing. And so uh, I think that as a sort of uh, uh, practice is, is important to kind of distinguish from uh, traditional print-based practice in architecture. And that's just something where you also can take a position. You can also say, that's not for me. I prefer, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a paper person only. Um, and this is not the way that I want to engage with architecture. Or you're saying, actually, I want to become an activist and make the most viral post that you know will make my cause uh, uh, that will highlight, highlight my cause or change something in the world. Or, I mean, there's there's many different positions and practices that can be taken within within social media. Um, and here in this essay, uh, he's talking specific about exhibitions, but I think it it applies to social media and sort of architecture production as well. Um, so what he's saying, um, online exhibitions do not take place in a unified coherent space. So when you're creating something, it doesn't mean that it will look like that in somebody else's screen, right? They have a different size. So it's an important thing to remember that 
everything will be transformed. The poor image will uh, uh, arrive potentially because of network. You know, maybe the audio quality uh, isn't that great in that lecture. I mean, I have no control over how you are receiving that content. So um, uh, that's kind of what he say, says about online exhibitions involve arranging a multifaceted mise-en-scene to accommodate an unfolding event, which is literally what we're doing right now, right? We're sort of creating a mise-en-scene, a sort of scene, um, but that is unfolding live, but we don't really know how, where it goes and how it arrives. Um, and then finally, relations, exhibitions as a whole are social processes. Again, you can say the same thing about architecture, publishing in a sense and online exhibitions are social processes play out via computer networks. So again, full loop back to the definition of what, what social media is. It is a social process that plays out in a network. Um, all right, to end, I would like to go back to this meme. Uh, uh, you know, remember the original quote was, I am a monument. And uh, so the, the super quick tutorial workshop that really will take only a few minutes, uh, show you how to, make, how to make something like this. So how to sort of make a 3D meme. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll show you that, just sort of like the crucial steps. Um, and, then, and then we'll have, you know, a discussion for another 10 minutes or so. Is that, is that good? Any thumbs up or down? Send me some stuff in the chat, please. Encouragement. <laughs> Um, you guys want to see, you guys want to see how I made this? Yes? Okay. Okay, cool. All right. <laughs> you know, social media is about vanity. You need to, you need to get feedback. <laughs> All right, cool. So, uh, and I know, oh, my screen share is paused. Okay. Can you? Can you still hear me? Oh, okay. I think I have to reshare my screen because I'm showing. Okay, I guess, sorry. I'm, I... Oh, hi. I think somebody muted me. I don't know what just happened. Can you hear me? You just muted and unmuted yourself. I think you might have just been pressing the wrong button. Oh, no. I, was, I, I opened the Rhino uh, and I think, but you can hear me now, right? Okay, awesome. So uh, I opened the Rhino file and then did all kinds of things to my screen. <laughs> um, all right, I'm gonna share my screen again and open the, the Rhino. Um, yeah, because I cannot just share my screen in general. I just only can share one particular software. So I might have to switch back and forth a little bit. Um, anyway. You guys can see the Rhino screen now, right? Yes. Okay, awesome. So uh, I am not going to go into too much detail about how I made this part because there's lots of really great tutorials on the skills trails uh, about how to create a 3D model in Rhino. Um, there's just one important, and there's also tutorials about how to apply textures um, and how to sort of, uh, you know, uh, basically how to get how to get to this point. Um, I mean, as you saw, I kind of took the original meme, and now I don't know if you can see my photo. No, okay, I can switch between different applications. That's a little silly. Um, okay, um, but. Uh, the point is, so I was trying to show you in Photoshop how this, how I made these textures, but it's very simple. I just took the actual textures from the original meme, from the original image, and kind of like skewed them and scaled them to fit onto a rectangle because obviously they need to be flat, right, so that it can fit onto onto this box. And also made this pattern a little bit more regular because it looked very weird and twisted on on that page. So um, when you have your Rhino model and you have all the textures on it like you want, you should do one important step. I'm going to show you here with a box. You just need to press mesh and that will turn that object into a mesh, 
and you see how uh, when it is a Rhino object, it is just a box, and when it becomes a mesh, you see this little line going across, like here. So that just become it becomes a different type of geometry, and it becomes the type of geometry that you can upload to the web. And again, we'll go into more detail about about sort of how to complex more upload more complex meshes later. But importantly, it's just you know when you just export straight from Rhino, um, it won't work as well. The best thing is to mesh it first. And uh, in this case, it's a simple geometry, so I don't have any problems with it being very, very heavy. If you have bigger geometries, you might want to pay more attention to that. So the whole trick is then you say file, export selected, and then you export it as an FBX. So here, I already have it preset, so I'm calling it 3D beam. All right, and now in that folder that, okay, now I have to switch back, sorry, to, to share my other screen. It's a little annoying. Can you share? Oh, okay. Um, okay, so now you can see my, you can see the presentation again, right? Yep. Okay. Um, so uh, I was mentioning earlier, uh, Sketchfab. So uh, I saved uh, on my desktop, which you unfortunately can't see right now, but basically in that folder that, um, that I just made, I, I, I saved a, uh, a file called 3D Meme and that I'm going to upload right now, the FBX file. So here, um, so when you get to the Sketchfab tab, you have the upload button right here. Um, and you just drag and drop your file straight in there and say upload file. And because it's a small file, it goes really, really quickly. And it'll just take like a few minutes to process. Uh, I won't make you wait. I just already preloaded so you can actually see how it looks. So now uh, you, once, once it's done processing, you can actually edit your meme on the web. It should look you know, kind of very similar to the way it looks in Rhino. Um, and here you can set a few different settings. You, kind of, you can play around with the background. Um, usually I recommend making it white. Uh, if you want to embed it on the web page, for example, you can play around with the rotation uh, of, of the scene and so on. And then you can also set the scale in, if you would, sorry, I just have to close people know right? Um, <laughs> um, so here you can see how, how the object would look like in VR if you would have a person in there, which is also pretty cool. So you can, you know, you can set the scale of that object in relation to a human being to actually see that in virtual space. Um, so when you know, when you're done with your settings and you're happy with how it looks like, you can change different lighting and so on. Um, then you can just save save your scene. I'm gonna go exit. Uh, and all right, uh, go now into my model so you can see. Uh, you can see the model. Oh. Right where it was. Okay, here, here it is loading. So when when it, when it published the meme, it looked like something like that in within Sketchfab. Um, and when you have that, you can actually you can just send a link to somebody and share it. Make sure. Okay. Um, so you can you know I can send this to you guys. I'm going to actually send it to you in the chat. So you guys can actually see the, uh, if I can find it now, it's gonna close, right? Uh, there it is. All right, so you guys see the, you guys can click on it and actually, actually rotate around the 3D. But you can also generate an embed code. So if I click on this, I can just, um, you know, generate an HTML embed code. I copied that to my clipboard 
And I can go to a website, so I'm going to a Carpo website, which is kind of the website builder that I, I like to use for my project. And here, you can see I, I already pre-did pre that, but essentially you can now just uh, go ahead and put, add that, add that um, HTML code that you've created onto your website by going into code view. And so I'm going just to delete this part so you can actually see how it looks before I put it in. So this is how my website looks like normally, right? And if I want to add, I'm going to hit save and remove, remove the 3D thing. Now if I go into code view, HTML, all I need to do is you don't need to edit anything. You just say, you just paste the code that you just automatically created here. You say, okay. And then you have it as a little window within your website. And if you want to change something about the settings, you can just regenerate it here. So let's say I wanna make it bigger, I wanna make it 2000 pixels times 1000, and I want it to be rotating the whole time. It regenerates a new code. It's copied to the clipboard. I go into code view, copy it in there. And now if I hit save and I close it, let's say, for the next few hours, I'm going to have this meme on my web page, so you can just, <laughs> and I'm going to send it to you guys as well, so you can actually see how it looks on there. So, you know, again, see it, see how it looks on yours, but essentially I can now zoom around this 3D object and have it on my, on my page, um, how I want it. And don't worry if you didn't catch every single step of this, I will make a video explaining this in a little bit more detail, but I just wanted to show you guys the basic um, steps of that. I'm going to stop sharing my screen. All right. All right, this is the moment when everyone should turn on their, their, um, their video, please. <laughs> you all also now have access to unmuting yourself. So if someone wants to unmute themselves to ask a question or to engage Pika in dialogue, you can now do that. Um, by clicking on um, just, it should be in the bottom left or in the top um, to just like mute or unmute. But definitely do turn on your video just so I can see, so I can see you guys. Um, and uh, yeah, any, any questions or questions and also, I guess my question to you guys is how do you feel about social media and do you have any, um, you know, uh, attitudes or fears or uh, uh, positions towards social media that you have right now and that, that, that you want to share? Don't be shy. <laughs> Um, yeah. Hey, Pika, I guess I had a question, maybe more about the technical portion of it, although I'm happy to get into the, the dialogue as to like what social media does. Um, I was wondering, uh, for these more complex models, do you have a sense of like what the platform is, like that gallery space that you shared with us? Would that also be through Sketchfab? Yeah, you could you could use Sketchfab, but um, he used Modelo, which is very similar. So it's more like a matter of uh, what you you know personal preference of what kind of platform you like to use. Modelo is a platform specifically developed for architects, um, but there's you know there's a few different different ones out there. I personally like Sketchfab. Um, because it gives me a little bit more control and allows to annotate things. Um, but Modelo is also a really great one to try. And I think when you get into that kind of stuff, uh, you probably should try a few different ones and see which one works for you. Thanks so much. <laughs> um, but you also said, what, so I'm curious, you know, what's your position towards, uh, you said you have some thoughts on the debate part as well. <laughs> 
sorry to put you on the spot. But <laughs> no, no worries. Thank you so much for, for the talk. I thought it was really, really interesting and really well done. Um, I mean, I personally have some questions from like an activism uh, standpoint. Uh, and I thought the, the examples that you shared were really illustrative. Um, like through the efforts that we have with like the student group that I'm a part of, right? Like right now, we're trying to come up with like a social media strategy. And it is about kind of questions of packaging and questions of clarity and like a lot of the things that you were talking about, maybe not necessarily about the, well, I guess, virality, but in a, in a different way. So not so much leaning into the humor, not so much leaning into the, you know, maybe the, the, the shock of it because it's more of a solemn kind of discussion. So I guess maybe just even hearing your thoughts about that, like what, what would you advise as to like how to lean into like bigger questions of like racial justice, of, you know, immigration justice, international rights, um, yeah. <laughs> I mean, hmm. I, I, you know, I, we can chat offline and if, I would love to hear more about the specific uh, project that you're doing or specific issues. Um, and I do think that the second point in terms of appealing to people's uh, emotions or, uh, you know, also, uh, in, also their anger, it can be a very effective strategy. And it's not, you know, I think there's something uh, a little like, marketing -y or dirty about talking about these effective strategies and it's not really how um how i wanted to frame this talk but i did think that you know the analysis that Lemar Schiffman did in this very academic paper actually where she came to the six points was helpful for me in understanding or sort of thinking about a lot of posts that i had seen for example the two different posts uh, that I showed that were from an actor's practice and the other one from a uh, this colleague that kind of exposed her her journey at the Met they actually and I don't think these people were doing that strategically I think they just you know we all have developed some kind of intuition with social media and I think they they probably did think about the post a lot but and they but they had a lot of these these elements and I, I thought it was interesting you know, again, from a more anthropological perspective in terms of like what works or how does psychology really work um, to understand or kind of unpack how, how, how this type of, how the sharing reflex gets activated. Um, I don't think that, you know, in terms of it being a random, funny, whimsical thing versus a big, it being a very serious social justice issue that in the end, I don't think there's like preset ways that one should be treated that way and that one should be treated a different way. I think it's very, I think there's also lots of really, um, you know, uh, I don't know if fun is the right word, but like ironic memes going around that deal with issues of social justice that can be very effective. You know, I don't think that you have to necessarily, because it's a serious issue, only address it in a serious way. I think you can also turn it around or expose an issue through humor in certain cases. So I think that there's, yeah, pretty complex in the end. But no, I, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> it's different different models, but I, I, I really appreciate that, that part of the discussion. So thank you. Pika, do you want to go to the, the comment that's in the chat? Um, I can read it to the group or you can read it if you'd like. Do you have a preference? Um, yeah, I'll, I'll read it. Okay, so here it says, not a question really, but I think social media needs to be better defined. It's a useful tool, tool and there are examples of where social media works as its name suggests, but on the biggest platforms and how 95% of people think of it, social media is a misnomer. Hmm. <laughs> That's Kevin. Is it, are you around Kevin? <laughs> I'm here. Um, can you can you expand on that? I'm not entirely sure. Yeah, I guess I just when I think of it, I think if you went and asked you know anyone on the street what do they think when they think of social media, they'll say Facebook, they'll say Instagram, they'll say Snapchat, you know the big names, big platforms. 
um, TikTok, Twitter, etc. But then if you ask them, you know, what does you think social mean or social media means, they'll, they'll talk about how it's a connected platform that encourages you know, multi-directional, meaningful communication. And I think those two ideas don't really go together. I think the people are, you know, using Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat or whatever, they're trying to put their idea out there and they're not really looking for further discussion about that. It's, here's my opinion, I'm trying to get it out to as many people as I can, which is totally valid, important tool that didn't exist before because you know, it is bringing that level of communication down, you know, flattening the hierarchy there. But it's not, I think, the collaborative atmosphere that some of the other tools that you talked about really were. So I think, and I think definitions are important. Uh, so I think we just need to think differently about how we look at these two different things. So they're, they're just very different, I think, and they're all lumped together with the name social media. I'm just curious your thoughts about that, I guess. That's a good point. And it's actually something I I was struggling with and, and, and in, in preparing this lecture because, uh, you know, what and and then as I, as I said in the beginning, I decided to take social media in its broadest sense. Um, you know, because I do think you can make an argument, and there are multiple theorists and people saying that social media goes way beyond what, like you said, the person on the street considers it. So there's there's sort of the uh, the colloquial meaning of it, and then there's also the sort of uh, uh, let's say more. If you, if you actually break it down to a definition, you know, a lot more things, uh, a lot more media fit in into that. So I think it's definitely a somewhat elastic term at the moment. But I absolutely agree with you that it would be helpful to have more terms and more specific terms for these different groups. For example, the social VR platforms. I do think they're social media, but we don't, you know. How do you really differentiate them or would they yeah they're they're, they're kind of like they are its own thing and they're kind of definitely separate and even mm -hmm. you know instagram works very very differently from twitter and so yeah I, all i'm saying is <laughs> i think i think i think working on these definitions is a is, is a good and helpful thing um where do you find your architecture memes do you have any favorite accounts also, I think that social media can be very useful to spread information, organize large communities, but it can become negative when it extracts from actual life or when personal information becomes available to uninfinite audiences. Yeah. Um, also, if anybody else wants to answer that question, I'm also. <laughs> um, I, yeah, I do have some favorite accounts. So Ryan Skavnitsky, his, his handle is Scav. I can share it with you guys. Uh, on the group chat, he, he has really, really funny memes. Uh, and then there's a, an account called Dank Lloyd Wright. That's really funny. Um, I can recommend that too. They're just, you know, somewhere between political and just hilarious, just like nonsensical. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean that, you know, and again, that was a bit of a disclaimer. Um, Social media can be creative and there's harassment that can happen. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm definitely sometimes overthinking. Is it, who else is sometimes overthinking what, what they're post, posting? <laughs> A few people, not so many. Okay, most of you seem to be like, yeah, or you just don't, or. <laughs> I mean, for me, it's definitely, um, you know, I want to be careful because there's also, yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, there's, there's definitely such a thing as uh, oversharing or people who are just, you know, you just have to follow them because they, they, they post like too much or, and then, or, or just this classic idea of this like very curated life. And that applies to architecture very much. I mean, there's so many firms that have, uh, like a very, very perfect, pristine architecture profile. I mean, to me, maybe the, the biggest example is Bjarke Ingels' Instagram, right? Like it's, I mean, during Corona, he went to Mexico and posted like a photo of himself, one month Mexican. And it was just so inappropriate. It was like, okay, like what I, like, <laughs> you know, and um, 
but he's a public figure and there, were, there was immediately a lot of backlash for, from some of the accounts that I men mentioned that took that and made memes out of it, you know, so, but then is that harassment towards an individual person? I mean, there's a lot of, lot of questions here, right? Like how, how if somebody's a public person, you can um, take their posts and ridicule them potentially, or is that also not okay? I mean, I think, yeah. On, the, on this very small scale of the architecture community is also, I mean, actually, I don't know if I should be talking about it here, but like GSUB, it's fine, GSUB, GSUB uh, publications recently published a book um, that got heavily criticized on Instagram. And I don't know if that was the only criterion, but I think one, it was part of why the book ended up being um, uh, not, not published at the time, but it kind of, you know, re, um, drew it back and so on. So it, it's, yeah, it's, I guess in the end you can, you, you know, there's a term for it, which is called cancel culture. So it's, 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 it's a really problematic uh, uh, and difficult field to, to navigate, you know, because on one hand, it's good when people are calling things out, but it can also have unintended consequences. One more question and then let's go make some collages. <laughs> I was gonna just like, um, hi guys, I'm Lila, I'm the director of events at GSAP um, and I just wanted to uh, maybe just like the past couple of things I've been typing in, I added one uh, meme account that you didn't mention which is load bearing column which the yeah, that's really mm -hmm. modernist ho is there. Thing. I also would encourage all of you to um, follow McMansion Hell on Twitter, um, which is another, McMansion Hell is like a fantastic blog and it's sort of like pre-social media as social media days um, where like blogging was a much more popular thing than it is now, like actually just like writing down your ideas rather than, it's sort of like pre-meme, right? Um, in, in some ways, not actually pre-meme because memes have been existed forever, but um, sort of pre-meme, so I just wanted to like bring up McMansion Hell as like a, an option for all of you guys to, to think about. But I want to just like think through a little bit like the negativity or the idea of negativity about um, like the idea of Bjarke being sort of like harassed or, or, or whatever. And then also see back, the, the book had some challenges and, and the publishers sort of understood that it had some challenges, but that social media conversation really pushed like power to like, like more fully acknowledge. And I think that's something that's really interesting that's happening right now that we're seeing a lot. And I'm saying this as a, as a person, as an individual um, who's been, you know, working on social media and doing these things, not as like a representative of the institution in the same way that Pika is a, is a person teaching a class at GSAP, but is not necessarily a representative of the institution as it relates to this kind of social conversations. But um, I think it's really interesting, this shift that we have seen in a sort of like a democratization of like how power is distributed. And I think that social media really allows that to happen. And I think that especially situations um, like this, like holding power to account in a real way is just much more possible than it used to be. Um, and I think that that's like really an important kind of thing to think about, um, especially as students or future students or future architects or future urbanists or whatever it is that you want to be to like think about how something like an Instagram account for you and your work and like your thoughts or like these memes is representative of like you as a whole person. It allows you to be a whole person in a way that um, that just placing only your design out there might not. And I think that that's something that the field as a whole is really struggling with right now. And it's sort of like these kind of like back and forth and backlash is like, can we be designers and, um, you know, lauded for our work, but then also, you know, can you like someone's work, but not like them as a person? Can you, you know, that's sort of like this question of cancel culture, right? So um, I think that these, this discussion is kind of just starting. It's just starting to break um, as it relates to, to social media. And I'm really interested in where it will go. Um, and something that I just like, I think a lot about as a person who like helps students make things and, and does things with students. So, um, 
I'm really interested. This is an amazing sort of like primer to like get you thinking about also like how you represent yourself um, as a designer and as a person in the world as you sort of embark on this journey. So I guess that's kind of the, the message that I wanted to quickly pop in. There are two more questions now in the chat, which I'll, so I'll pop back out and, and let you answer, but I just wanted to like leave that little Yeah, thank you. Yeah, um, I very much, very much agree. I think it's um, I mean, social media has been around for a long time, but I, I think it has reached a certain intensity recently due to uh, you know recent events that 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 I think catalyzed it in a totally new way for our discipline. And I think that's why it is an important moment. That's why also the way that you guys will pick it up is so important because we don't know you you'll make it your own thing right and you'll use it in your own um ways that that are just starting now so uh here um <laughs> okay we have uh we have three questions three questions the last one i just won't respond to are there any architects using tiktok in an interesting way i don't know that's a question to you guys i'm too old for tiktok <laughs> But if you guys have an answer, please just type it into uh, into the group chat. Um, the next question was: Is social media uh, does social media encourage tolerates a kind of inauthenticity because it has inevitable performative quality that's hindering social media activism? Should this be a concern? Thinking about black hashtag Blackout Tuesday. Yeah, I actually was considering if I should include Blackout Tuesday in this, but it's I mean I think there were just so many things that went wrong with that. Day and the way that I, I mean it was you know again when we all um, we should maybe do a happy hour <laughs> zoom and discuss it and vent about like you know what everybody's frustration different ways with that I think um, it definitely tolerates inauthenticity I mean I think that's for sure um, but I don't think it hinder I don't think the inauthenticity in itself hinders social media activism. I really don't think so because I, I, again, activism, you know, is extremely effective on social media. So, and uh, there's actually, there's a, a paper about it that basically says, well, you know, how, how effective or how, how, can you really correlate the use of social media with people going to protest? And it, it is complex, right? Because there, it's not just an easy, like, Thing where you can say okay people have been using Facebook this much and then they went to protest because so many people are using Facebook so it's like a complex equation to actually figure this out and uh, but I read a paper that actually tried to make an argument or bring statistics together especially in, in sort of regions that aren't using social media so heavily that like a certain increase in users did mean that people would go to protest I mean maybe a more familiar example here I think Suddenly everyone was on Signal, I don't want to say why, or Telegram, right? <laughs> it might have something to do with people wanting to exchange information that wasn't public. So, um, again, I think, I think that the inherent performativity, at least in my eyes, and again, I'm happy to hear an opposing argument, doesn't automatically hinder social media activism. But, you know, open debate, obviously. Um, and then there's a question of Gergia. Last question, I guess. Um, speaking of the architect, I think it's interesting how social media plays a role in involving the public in conversations around who architects should work with. If they should be limited at all, an example that comes to mind is their reaction to Bjarke Engels meeting with the very controversial president of Brazil. Yes, that was a huge social media moment and also got lampooned in lots of posts. So Bolsonaro is um, you know, a very right-wing uh, uh, um, president of Brazil and and there was this photo of like a bunch of guys being like you know after a meeting proudly sort of showing showing off their newly made connections and I mean and and, and yeah Bjarke is you know Bjarke is a social media phenomenon for sure and he um yeah I mean I, I think I think it's I think the internet just has all this power to basically critique exactly these points and 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 bring them out and it, it got I think it, it also got picked up in Arctic newspaper and sort of like more official and serious media and I think that's another interesting effect where 
you can literally just follow one of these famous architects and start calling them out on things that you don't find correct and it might make its way in totally different uh, into totally different channels and that's that's what happened with that particular case you know um, yeah so I think I think sort of like uh, that particular idea of sort of like arch, you know sort of who the client is is definitely uh, something that I think has has a huge uh, or has kind of like become a huge and more important issue that, that that's been drawn up I think through social media even more so you could you could you could probably make that statement you know because people are more aware and and maybe in the past he would have met that guy and it would have never been documented because he wouldn't put it out himself right it wouldn't really make it into a newspaper it's not that newsworthy but because he he decided to be like hey this is my new buddy um then it got picked up same thing like with the mexican when he went to mexico right the same same thing he decided to tell us all that he's vacationing in mexico for a month i mean it was sort of a voluntary information that that got offered up um all right Okay, one more question and then we're really close. I think about Instagramification influences, how Instagramification, okay, okay. That is actually a good last question and I'll, I'll close on that. Um, so Sophia just asked how Instagramification influences the built environment. Uh, so that uh, was a huge thing when I worked at the Met, we called it the shareable moment. So, <laughs> which sounds a little nicer than Instagram moment, but essentially just means you should design something where people want to take pictures you know, some kind of background that people want to take pictures in front of. So, and there's certain qualities that these backgrounds have. They have, they're well lit, lighting is most important. They have bright colors, strong colors and big patterns. Um, or like, you know, that's also big sort of simple geometric shapes, think, things like that, photograph really well and create really good backgrounds. And I have this theory that I don't know, and I, it, I've recently discussed this with friends. I, I hope that you know, because right now we, we can't really go to physical locations and physical events. I'm hoping that the Instagram background is going to disappear <laughs> because now it's a Zoom background, right? We're creating a Zoom background. So I, I'm, I'm, but I'll leave that, you know, you guys decide you're the, you're the next generation. <laughs> but I mean, I think our behavior in social spaces is going to change. People still will be taking tons of photos, but architecture was extremely, complicit in that. I mean, it would even get marketed on travel websites. It would be like, oh, this apartment has an Instagrammable moment in it, right? I mean, and it became part of the developer language. It became part of architecture language and architects, you know, really chose to, to, to kind of emphasize that through their own social media and so on. So, I mean, being aware of it is already amazing. You guys are sort of like starting off on your journey and the fact that you're thinking about that now is kind of you know, will make you very, very aware and you can also decide if that's something you want to be doing or not. Um, yeah, I'll, I think I'll leave it with that and let you guys have some lunch and time. <laughs> all right, thanks for coming. Uh, and I mean, you all have my contact, I guess. Uh, and so email me and send me your ideas and memes. And if you have a cool meme, send it to me, I'll re repost it. I'll be your hub. <laughs> All right. Bye.